This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, recording from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. This conversation is with Professor Brian Reynolds of the University of California, Irvine. Though not specifically about things Shakespearean, this conversation will follow Shakespeare-influenced plays and acting and performance and theory that Professor Reynolds has been involved with throughout his career. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also from a generous grant from the JSPS. Hi, Brian, it's been a while since I've seen you and it's good to see you again. Thanks so much, Tom. It's really great to see you. Yeah, it's been a long time. How did we let seven years go by without you coming to Japan? I don't know. I'm really looking forward to coming back. I'd love to actually to do some skiing in Japan. Um, ah, ah. You guys are famous for your snow. And I'd like to get over there and um, check it out for myself. Um, I want to say it's really an honor to um, be interviewed on your program here. So thanks so much for that. Well, I want to do a shout out before we get into your work. I wanted to do a shout out to our friends at the Shakespeare Society of Japan. And that's where I met you at the meeting through Amy Hamana. And I think at that time you were doing a visiting professorship at Scuba, Di or Scuba University. I was. Uh, yeah. And so kind of under the sponsorship of Amy, I believe. And the JSPS. And the JSBS, that's right, which is uh, a sponsor of this program. And so let's get all of that out there, because these are our friends who have made all of this possible. What I want to do is move, at least have a, a segment here on your life and background, which is a, a bit atypical. You are New, New York City, born and reared, if, if I'm right, I think. I grew up in Scarsdale. Scarsdale of the famous diet. Yeah, like the diet. Who, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Townhour was my mom's doctor back then. Yeah. And so um, you're, you're destined to go to a very fine school and to, to go to a very fine college. And instead, you sort of bomb out in high school, if, if I'm using the word, just not really that interest, not engaged. Generous. It's, <laughs> and end up somewhere, somehow, on the other side, where you are now, on the West Coast, and involved with pretty extreme motorcycle racing, uh, motocross, uh, to fairly uh, dangerous, right? And I'm not sure how we got from the upper, well, from Scarsdale uh, to... I was born on the Upper East Side. On the Upper East Side, okay. Yeah, right. and from the Upper East Side to, uh, I'm assuming, driving a motorcycle dangerously in, in dangerous places somewhere in California. Could you move, move us from... <laughs> from the Upper East yeah. Side to California, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, sure, you know, growing up in Scarsdale, I mean, I, growing, having, when I was growing up there, I wasn't aware of how privileged, you know, we were to, to grow up there and have such a great school system. And, you know, we're, you know, pretty much everyone was rich. Um, you know, I, I, as I got a little older, I became more aware of that. Um, somehow relatively early on, I developed a very strong anti-establishment sensibility. I don't really know, you know, from where that came from exactly. Um, I was very sympathetic toward my uncle who was gay that would, had been really discriminated against growing up and was seen by his side of the family as being just kind of, you know, mentally deranged or something because of his homosexuality. And I think that really had a big impact on me as a kid because I was one of the only members of my family that would go and spend time with him. He lived in New York City on 54th and Lexington. We'd go to all the museums together and stuff. And he exposed me to a lot of things that I wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. And I'm really indebted to him for that. And he did have some brain damage because they'd given him um, electroshock to try and cure him of his homosexuality, as well as various you know, psych meds and stuff. At that time, even way more experimental than they are now. And so really he's um, a kind of a tragedy of a system, you know, that, you know, was designed to oppress him. And I think that, you know, that for me, that was some initial exposure. Also, my community was predominantly Jewish. Um, my mom's Jewish, her last name is Goldberg. And, and Judaism and her family was very important to their identity and culture. 
my dad's Protestant. <clears throat> and so I grew up, uh, you know, kind of immersed in the discourse of, of, about anti-Semitism, you know, and about sort of the plight of Jews in the world and, you know, and the things that are important to American Jewish culture, you know, especially education and philanthropy. And that really had a big impact on me. With my last name being Reynolds, you know, I was often in a position where I'd have to self-identify, you know, within, you know, my own community because there are kids that were, that discriminated against Jews, largely because they're in a community that was predominantly Jewish, I think, and they were Catholic and somehow like, you know, I, I was in some kind of in-between space there. Yeah. And, um, and I was very much aware of that. You know, like one time I remember my, in fifth grade, one of my best friends was running and all these kids were chasing him. And I stood in front of them to block, block them. And, and they're like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I mean, why are you running after him? And they said, because he called this other kid a kike. Right. And I was like, oh, <laughs> well, why do I stand aside and let them go? Or do I stand yeah. there? Yeah, it's time them? to make a choice. Uh, yeah. Did you do temple or uh, bar mitzvah, that, that sort of thing? Okay. So bar mitzvah is interesting. I'm following my brother's lead on this one, but you know, I make my own decisions is that I'm not a believer. And, um, and I really couldn't bring myself to, you know, express my belief in God when I don't believe in God. And um, my brother did the same. And this was really upsetting for our family, um, for my mom, especially, you know, my grandfather. And especially, you know, I, I went to so many bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs, like all my friends were doing it. Or you, you would know? go to others. You would go to other bar mitzvahs. Of course. Yeah, yeah. All year, every weekend for, you know, all of like eighth grade, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I wouldn't do it because I just said I wouldn't get up there and say something I didn't believe. And my friends were like, think of the money. <laughs> You're going to get so much money. <laughs> That's right, right. Because people hand you those envelopes. Right. Those yeah. envelopes. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't enough incentive for me. So, um, and then in high school, I just really just wasn't in this. I graduated high school for 1.4 average. So I was a pretty bad student. I was in during ninth grade, you know, I just skateboarded and and rode BMX and rode my motorcycle. I started racing when I was in, um, I guess in eighth grade, eighth grade, and uh, had a pretty serious injury to, um, for uh, not my first one, but a really bad one where I kind of just literally like just destroyed my right foot, smashed into a rock. And so the whole foot had to be reconstructed. And that was in the summer of going from eighth grade into ninth grade. Um, oh, so you, you, know, began, you began, there was, the, there was activity in, your area, like out, was it within? Oh yeah, yes. The, yeah, motocross is is national. It's international. Yeah, I started um, with motorcycles when I was nine years old. Nine years old. Yeah, okay. I got my first mini bike. Um, then uh, I built a track in the woods near my house, which was famously called the track. And um, people came from all over. So each morning, instead of going to school, I'd leave my house and I'd just go to the track, right? And I'd wait for my parents to leave to go to work. You know, they're both corporate folks and they'd go into the city and um, then I'd just go home and, you know, be at home or be down the track. And that's pretty much how, how I spent all of ninth grade. And then and then the school, um, you know, politely requested that I leave. So I went to a Catholic school for a year called Stephen, Archbishop Stepanek High School in 10th grade in uh, White Plains. Alan Alda actually went there too, not at the same time. Um, because I had a lot of friends from New Rochelle that were into motocross and stuff. And they were, you know, the town next to Scarsdale. And they had gone, they were going to, to Stepanek. So I thought, why not go hang out with my friends? But at the end of that year, Stepanek asked me to leave um, <laughs> because I just couldn't really bring myself to go to class. And I kind of had eternal jug, which is called Justice Under God, where every day you have to sit in a room after school. Yeah. And I essentially just kind of lost interest in sticking around for that. Yeah. And, and I think they hit me a little too many times. The they hit you. Would, oh, the teachers would hit you and the vice principal would hit you and and um, a lot of hitting going on there. Yeah. So, um, so then I went back to Scarsdale to be in a special program called CORE, which is for um, people that just really, you know, weren't that motivated. And yeah. actually it really worked for me. It was great. But I spend my time really being, I was really into the philosophy of Bruce Lee. I really embraced his idea of water, of becoming water, you know, kind of becoming water. Yeah. It being a really, you know, among the most powerful forces in the universe. 
because it's fluidity and its ability to erode and all the things that water does. And um, I just really dug, you know, sort of Bruce Lee's version of Zen Buddhism and Jeet Kune Do. And um, so I got really kind of more into the establishment along those lines. And I was also, um, you know, I like to party a lot and I was into a lot of like, you know, really into like psychedelic music and culture and played on the ultimate Frisbee team and raced motorcycles and skied. For me, it was all about skiing and motocross. How did you get, about, how did you get to California? Yeah, so it's going to tell you that. I don't want to spend too much time in my life. I feel a little self-conscious. I just want to know, did you take a, a plane? Did you walk? <laughs> how did you, you know, get there? So what happened was, is that my girlfriend, my high school sweetheart, um, Kim Savelson, she teaches at Stanford. Um, she was also in a similar situation, did similarly poorly in school and liked to have fun like me. You know, we were real fugitive explorers together. And, uh, and then uh, she was two years younger than me. So when I graduated, I waited for her. I raced motocross in the Eastern you know, circuit. And uh, with my dream of going out to California and racing the Southern California circuit and really trying to like get things going out here. And so um, I waited for her. And after two years, when she was ready to, to go, we headed out to California with my truck and a trailer, no prospects, um, and just moved out to uh, San Diego. Um, where, um, where I went to community, we both went to community college at Grossmont Community College. And I had this sort of fear of failing. So I took so many classes, I think, so that I'd have a good excuse if I failed. So I managed, so I managed to get my AA degree pretty quickly. And I even did the gym classes. I did everything while she was just keeping her kind of eye on the prize, which is going into the UC system and, you know, ideally going to Berkeley. Yeah. And then, um, and I was racing, but I had broken my neck. Um, you know, right when I got out and uh, C6, C7, and that was definitely on um, setback for me. Um, and so from that spinal cord injury, I have, you know, I'm, I have a disability, but I kept riding, you know, you know, I just sort of started to mellow out on the race thing as I got more interested in school. I just started really falling in love with ideas. And I started to see that I could make a, uh, you know, a valuable contribution to the world as a teacher, yeah. you know, being inside the system rather than outside. You know, I mean, Kim would make jokes that, you know, this is the, the kind of um, the structure of just institutionalizing me, you know, like dominant culture, finding a way to institutionalize me through the academia. Like, really, I'm being co-opted. You really uh, are being co-opted, right? It's, it's under, right. The, under, the, right. Uh, under the feeling, under the look and feeling that you have, you have some sort of agency in that, yeah. right? Yeah, the uh, agency versus structure uh, thing. Right. And uh, so, yes, yeah, to a completely deceive. I, I like to believe I had agency and all this. Yeah, but it right? was all part of the structure that led you to right. Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, I was just being somehow subsumed into it. Yeah, was Greenblatt uh, Green at Berkeley when you got there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll move on to Stephen. Yeah. So, um, so then I had this great teacher named Homer Lusk, who was a Shakespeare, taught me Shakespeare. Yeah. In some other classes at Grossmont Community College. And he really sort of shared with me that, um, first of all, it was so hard for me. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't done any writing in high school at all or anything. I mean, yeah. I really struggled. Like yeah. when I look back on what I wrote, it's illegible, incomprehensible. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, I don't know what I was doing back then, but I was giving it my best. Yeah. And then, um, but I did really well in community college because I really was tenacious. And I just, you know, I just worked so hard. Yeah. And it really helped also to have um, my girlfriend just being kind of relentless and making me stick to it, you know? And the inspiration I wanted, the inspiration was a community college professor. Mm -hmm. Not one of the big name. Uh, yeah, I it was Homer, Homer Lusk yeah. and another guy named Mr. Lamore, who um, <laughs> taught, I took a course from him on virtue and philosophy. Yeah. This guy was going through divorce and he was living in his office. And, <laughs> um, and he was just an incredible guy. Like yeah. just like a real, like um, generous, tremendous generosity of spirit yeah and i thought wow you know i'd like to be a guy like him or or homer lusk and really like you know do something like for other people you know yeah and you know what they were thinking at the time and they were they were worried it's probably in some cases uh into a bottle about the fact that 30 percent of their students don't make it through and that there are these kids who fall asleep while they're teaching and they, they don't see the awakening of a, of a young Brian, maybe not a first front row student quite yet, but this awakening, this dawning going on and how they have uh, transformed a, a life that if 
could have quite literally ended up in the mud to something actually very interesting and wonderful. Uh, that you don't you don't see that, and I think we do, we don't see it as teachers. Also, we we tend to see very clearly our failures or where our students don't do what we want, but we don't do our every now and then a student will get back to me, uh, and it's good when they do. Did you I ever get? That's, that's, I think that's true. Your, we don't know sometimes yeah. the impact that we're having. We can only hope that we're having it. Right. Did you get back with yours? In, in I did. I, I couldn't. Yep. Mr. Lamore vanished, so I don't know where he went off to. I wrote back to um, to Mr. Lusk, and he was appreciative. Yeah. You know, I mean, also he turned me on to so much great music, Gil Scott Heron, and all these other people, and yeah. like there's like a whole like way in which he was just like um, he was just he had this sort of '50s haircut, slick back, wore yeah. these velour, velour shirts. He often wore kind of like bell bottoms and cowboy boots. He yeah. had a pet pig and he drove this old Chevy Nova and yeah. he always had his marbles rolled up in the sleeve. <laughs> yeah, you know, like this guy was just like, you know, he kind of epitomized cool. And, um, and but he was just like a really, just somebody that just cared so much. And so, yeah, I wrote to him and he was just very brief. He's like, yeah, thanks. Glad that things worked out for you. Appreciate it. It was basically like that. It was like, but it was really nice. I mean, he just didn't like. It wasn't super lengthy. Yeah, yeah. It almost seemed to me like he gets these all the time. Yeah, yeah. But these people. Kind of I I think we are fortunate to be to be uh, very fortunate to be in the American system. We not enough good not enough good things are said. I have taught. I community college helped me get through graduate school because it allowed me to get a, that little bit of extra money. I could teach at the local community college while in uh, graduate school and get a, a little bit of extra money that helped uh, pay the bills for, while I finished. And it, and in doing so, met these students who, you know, the, the joke was if you have trouble getting a parking space the, the first day after two weeks, there'll be plenty of parking spaces because, you know, so many people quit coming to class. But the mm -hmm. people who did, and I remember going into one class, I was teaching an introduction to literature, and I had four students in that class who were front row, and they absolutely chewed me up and spit me out because I was not prepared for class. I just did not think yeah. that they were going to be that good. I mean, I, these are students who really want to be there. Yeah, they really yeah. want, they, and right. yeah. And, and they're all paying their way too, most likely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there, there are lots of, you know, in the UK, for instance, I don't think, I think that it would be very difficult to, to transition from what was one of their polys into this or that and get into, eventually get into Cambridge or one of their uh, elite schools. But uh, I have another friend who uh, did the same thing. He he was in junior college in California and ended up at Irvine and doing his, his PhD at Irv Irvine. And well, the California system is amazing in that you can go to community college here and then the UC system, providing you have a GPA at a certain level, guarantees you, you know, um, transferability, you know, but maybe not to, you know, all the schools I think have different, you know, criteria, but providing you meet with a, with a, you know, you know, say, I don't know exactly what they are, that you'll get to go. In my case, um, you know, Berkeley was our goal, but I didn't get in. So what happened was, is that I went to UCLA because I didn't realize that Berkeley had different requirements than the other UCs. You had to have um, statistics or a course like statistics, and you had to have the two semesters of language done already, right? So what I did was, um, so I went to UCLA, but then my girlfriend got into Berkeley. She's like, you know, our plan is Berkeley. It's not UCLA. So yeah. I was like, okay. So I was like, what do I do? She goes, well, drop out of UCLA, go back to community college, right? And reapply as a community college transfer again. So I was like, okay. So I went to community college. I took the French, it's an amount of community college. I took the statistics and we moved up to Berkeley and I went to Laney and Vista community colleges. I took um, the Bible as literature, a bunch of English literature courses and stuff. And I reapplied. Then I got a rejection letter. And then I'm, I'm crying, you know, she comes home. We have this incredible house we're living in right by People's Park, right on Hoga's Avenue. We have a great community of friends. We're just loving it there. We're big time deadheads too. And we're loving our culture, yep. our scene. And I, she comes in, I'm in tears. She's like, what's up? And I was like, I'm gonna have to go back to UCLA. She says, no, you're not. 
just write them a letter and tell them they made a mistake. I was like, okay. So I wrote them a letter all about motocross and, you know, and like my life aspirations and all kinds of things and went in, hand delivered it. Well, five days later, I got an acceptance letter. <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 um, the recent scandal about people buying their way, you know, back channeling and so forth is, is so stupid. You know, because sometimes no doesn't mean no, uh, according to my psychology teacher in high school. She says mm -hmm. sometimes no means just ask again. Just yeah, go in there and harder, ask again. Right? Yeah. And and you did. And anything that I can attribute to success in my life was, uh, well, my current job, I remember getting for anything. All of us have had rejection. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, th there you have it. Uh and uh, you went from Berkeley to Harvard. You went back in. Yeah, so I met Stephen. Very East so, Coast. Uh, now, after the deadhead stuff, what about Harvard? Did you feel like you were a little uh, fish out of water? Or okay. yeah, in Berkeley, I you know really had to bust my ass to actually to like, really worked really hard. But I did have we did have a good community of friends. We hung out at a friend's house that was called the Day Glow Mushroom House. You can imagine <laughs> what went on there. Yeah, and um, you know we had a really good time. Got really into like camping and doing stuff. My motorcycle and all my equipment and all my tools and everything was in my trailer. We're all sitting in storage there at this point. Yeah. You know, all that started to take a back seat to just doing my schoolwork. Yeah. And um and then I I had Steven in a Steven Greenblatt in a class, uh, Paul Alpers, um, a lot of teachers like uh, Elizabeth Abel and John Bishop, a Joyce scholar and a whole bunch of really great people. And I started to notice some things that um, that just weren't really jiving with my life experience. Um, one of which was that um, uh, desire is predicated on lack. Yeah. You know, I yeah. felt like I really, I, that's how I really became interested in Deleuze and Guattari. Yeah. I found that like, um, like for me, I thrive on desire. Like, you know, yeah. I don't feel like it's motivated by lack. It's yeah. not compensation or something. Yeah. Also the idea of definition through negation yeah, yeah. Like I really just this idea that we know what something is by what it's not. That seemed exclusionary as a kind of logic. Um, I didn't think of that. It didn't apply to me individually or as a group. You know, it seemed to be hierarchical, you know, a way of thinking about the world. And so then I started really getting to Derrida, you know, who's really resisting this formulation. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had a lot of psychoanalytic teachers, you know, Ann Banfield, Janet Edelman, um, you know, Elizabeth Abel and stuff. But it just wasn't working for me. Also, the idea of the, the unconscious developing early on as being something that we have to sort of reconcile, get in touch with and reconcile with. For me, my if I have an unconscious, which I don't subscribe to, it's developing wherever my consciousness goes. So all these different things started to show up for me, like this idea. I mean, I started to really get into sort of post-structuralist discourse, um, just loved it. Like it really spoke to me as a person. And um, but except for this idea that um that we have no agency. You know that we're just kind of part of the system you know and i love foucault i mean foucault has been so important to me i can't even tell you but i really felt that like all he gives is a resolution is that we can be a point of resistance and i felt that for me that wasn't what i'm being flipped here a little bit but for me that wasn't enough i wanted to sort of develop a sort of a theory and methodology and really a performance aesthetics that would um speak to my life experience as a way to kind of harness powers around me you know, that sort of would encourage people to be more compassionate and through compassion to, to make change happen in the interest of creating a more egalitarian society. To also to sort of create a kind of aesthetics to life that was more adventurous and exploratory and really kind of makes life richer um, and just more grateful and generous. And so that's where transversal poetics came out of. Is For me, it was a response to, first I was just so enamored with the different critical methodologies and approaches. I thought they were like the coolest things. But then once I've encountered the subversion containment paradigm or the entrapment model of, uh, on the one hand, new historicism and then culture materialism, and Alan Sinfield was a teacher of mine who was a visiting professor there at the time, mm -hmm. that I was just like, well, <laughs> that's not very encouraging. If you're gonna say the state just encourages distant activity so they can suppress it and further consolidate its power. Yeah. I said, I said, no, we need to sort of, you know, you know, kind of conceptualize things differently and formulate differently. So yeah. what I wanted to do was come up with a way to do that and address all those ones I mentioned to you, right? The desires, lack, formulation, the idea of the unconscious, the sort of the sort of 
evacuation of agency within the subject. Yeah. The, um, the idea of the self is something with which we need to get in touch, you know, like as if there's a singular self. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I really feel like my experience is that myself is, is a process, it's processual. You yeah. know, I feel like while there might be something about me that I'd recognize in me at 10 years old, if I called myself on the phone and talked to me, or if I saw myself on the street, yeah. I feel for the most part, I've been changing my whole life. And so subjectivity for me is really sort of transversal to the subject. Yeah. And that, you know, there's ways in which we're subjectified, but the process by which we sort of become and come to be, and then the occasional moments when we sort of expand transversally, then uh, allows our subjective territory to grow and to encompass more and more and more so that we live a life kind of a yes and as opposed to, you know, no but. Yeah. And if we can keep sort of expanding and becoming more. Yeah. So, so why, why Shakespeare? Shakespeare for me is interesting is that um, when I started, when I had Homer Lusk, I was like, wow, this is really, really hard. You know, I didn't believe how hard it was. I was like, what language is this guy writing in? So I, I really liked the challenge. First, yeah. first it was the challenge. Like it seemed like so many cool ideas there and stuff that I really wanted to just try to figure it out. And so I really got into Shakespeare for like the purest reasons. You know, that Shakespeare somehow was speaking to me in ways unbeknownst to me, right? Like something was just lighting up for me. So it started there. And then Greenblatt really pushed that even further because he has, he really taps into the magic of Shakespeare. Yeah. He loves the way he talks and gets into it. And, you yeah. know, for him, Shakespeare has a spirituality to it. But yeah. then there's something else that I realized is that Shakespeare is such a competitive, such a huge field. You know, and the Shakespeare industry is so like crosses so many different terrains yeah. and discourses that I really I also saw Shakespeare studies is a kind of um, is an opportunity really to sort of like to you know to um, be more adventurous to get more exposure to explore new you know sort of avenues of expression. I mean, for me, it was between Joyce or Shakespeare. You know, there are like eight Joyce scholars in the country. Yeah, you know? and like for Shakespeare, there are like hundreds of them. So, yes. And I always had kind of um, aspirations of doing some kind of theater stuff. I've always loved theater. My parents took me to theater all the time growing up. And so this was sort of on the back burner for me. And then I ended up writing a dissertation, you know, that was very personal, you know, about criminal culture in early modern England. And that since I had so much exposure to this culture growing up, um, you know, I did spend quite a bit of time with, with a lot of criminals when I was a kid. And um, that I, and also then looking at groups that were discriminated against. And I just started to, um, it kind of resonated for me in a way that things hadn't before. And I really wanted to develop a model for understanding identity formation, subjectivity, sort of a subcultural formation, you know, and how these things sort of develop. And so that's really what that project sort of, how that project kind of came to be. Cause I began working on gender stuff and then it, I ended up moving and looking at subcultures. Yeah. Right now, I'm just finishing up a book that I've been writing for 10 years with Mark Levine, who is a professor of history here at the University of California, Irvine, um, you know, where I teach. And um, it's on political groups and conflict zones that use cultural production as a mode of political activism. So typically what Mark and I do is we go to different parts of the world in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. Those are our, our sites where there's some kind of conflict and we go to see what kind of art's being produced by different political groups in the interest of making change. Um, sometimes in conjunction with, you know, using weapons or violence, but oftentimes not. And so we sort of look at the relationship between artistic production and maybe more sort of military interventions or other kinds of protests. And as part of this project, We've been doing collaborations with different um, institutions, artistic communities at our various locations so that we're working on the ground with them doing immersive ethnographic research um, that's collaborative, you know, and creative together and um, is a way sort of to really get to know the people in the different locations to develop projects so that we can get them attention outside for grants and funding and also so that we can network them with people in similar circumstances in other parts of the world. For instance, in the Niger Delta in um, 
around Port Harcourt in Nigeria. Um, we've been working with um, Chococo. It's a um, it's a media shed that he created there in order to give young people the opportunity to create music and get more exposure. And much of the works um, produced in response to the devastation that the oil industry has caused that region. I mean, literally, the people there are you know walking around in puddles of oil. Um, their land has been completely destroyed. And so we've also we're also working with people in Turkana in northern Kenya, who are also now contending with total oil and sort of the extraction of oil in their region and sort of them being pushed off their lands. And so what we've done is we put the people in in Nigeria and contact the people in Kenya so that they could tell them what to expect and better prepare themselves for um, you know, for the oil company takeover. And this has been really helpful and also to raise money for them and also get them legal um, you know, support pro bono. And so these are the kinds of projects that Mark and I have been working on. Most recently, I just got back from um, Cairo, Egypt two, two weeks ago, where I produced a new play that I wrote called um, um, No Erasure with my friend um, Jesus Lopez. And we worked with Dara Arts. So a transversal theater company is a company that I worked with and co-founded in 2003. And we're officially based in Amsterdam um, in the Netherlands. And we typically do projects, you know, at least one or two a year, one of which is kind of a project in collaboration with a, with an, you know, a theater company or other artistic institution. And one of mine and Mark's research sites as well as doing a more conventional, and not really conventional, but conventionally presented, um, you know, um, theater project, you know, either in Europe or in the United States. And this project was something we've been developing for a few years with Dar Arts. And the idea was to produce my play Railroad, which is a Holocaust play about a German Jewish family um, left on a cattle car, supposedly on their way to Auschwitz, that like the Nazis would leave the cars on the tracks with a hundred people in them until everyone died. This family is left in the car, and then there's a Nazi family that steals their identity and um, passes as Jews and immigrates to the United States, and it ends with their descendants celebrating the 4th of July in Battery Park as Jews, talking about how they, their, their grandparents had managed to escape um, death. And, um, and so the idea here was to do it in, in Arabic. We had the play translated into Arabic with Dawar and to really sort of promote discussion there among um, different intellectual and artistic communities about the Holocaust and issues related to the Holocaust. And then what happened was a week before the show was going to start rehearsing, um, the actors got nervous about doing the show and they were afraid of um, actually landing in jail um, or, just, or just disappearing because mm. the show could be misinterpreted as being sympathetic to Israel. And um, it was sort of, to some extent, it was a little risky already doing a play that has Yiddish in it and Hebrew and and um, and being about Jews and the Holocaust, but then they were afraid of the association. So then we had a week before rehearsals we were going to start, and our company planned to come over and a huge production involving roughly fifty people, but we had no play. Oh. So um, so then uh, we proposed doing a play that I had written about the occupation in Palestine some years back that we produced in Janine with the Freedom Theater in Janine Refugee Camp and the Freedom Theory. Theater is a very progressive and politically engaged um, Palestinian theater company. And then we'd gone there and done that, which is a whole other story because the, the play is about Nabisala, which is a frontline village um, against the occupation that had protests roughly for about seven years every Friday. And the experience in Nabisala is very much very different from the experience of Palestinians that live in Janine. And so um, the play is really about how the sort of deployment of children in political activism and the risks involved and sort of exploitation among other factors. This is a very, um, very serious topic for Palestinians, you know, is how the children are treated, you know, in protests or, you know, by the IDF as well and how they can be incarcerated for no reason and tortured and so forth. And um, Ahed Tamimi at that time was the, uh, a girl in the town that I wanted to write the play about and I wanted to make it an immersive play, being in the protest, being you know shot at with you know steel marbles covered in plastic and rubber coated bullets and you know and tear gas and stun grenades and sound grenades and so forth. And um, and Ahed um, was at that time she was I think about twelve, and she was one of the 
most provocative figures in the protest, getting a lot of attention from the media. And, um, and then some years later, she became a huge international celebrity in that she was um, um, incarcerated for hitting an IDF soldier, trying to get the soldier off her land um, mm. after, have, after there being a protest in which her brother's arm was broken a few days earlier mm. um, by an IDF soldier. And um, so after getting a lot of international attention, now she's become a much bigger figure. But at the time, I was really fascinated by her. And so we had done this play, we, we brought this play to Janine to do it with the Freedom Theater and the artistic directors approved the play. But then we got into, I'm gonna bring these things together. When we got into, into a rehearsal, the actors refused to do it. So here we were with our theater company in Janine, ready to go. And we did the reading of the play and the actors said, no, we're not doing this play. And we said, okay, well, you know, why not? We had an amazing discussion. It went on almost for like eight hours. and. Um, where we talked about all kinds of issues, but really the, the, the issue for them was that we had an, an Israeli character. Um, there are a lot of um, Israelis that are referred to as refuseniks, and they're Israelis that support Palestinians. And every week at the protest that would happen Friday afternoon in Nabasala, there would be many Israelis there to support the Palestinians. Well, the Palestinians in Jenin said that in their experience, they, they would never collaborate with Israelis and no one ever came there to support them. And that they don't feel that there's, you know, that this is really possible in their lives. While it might be possible for Navasalians, it's not for them. And therefore they don't want to represent it in a play. Of course I said, well, you guys do Shakespeare sometimes, <laughs> you know, that's not your experience. And but yet you do it. And they said, yeah, well, that's different. In this case, it's about our own lives. And so I said, okay. So I went up, went back to my, um, we're staying in this in the Janine Cinema Guest House, um, which has now been torn down. It was the only theater in Janine. And then it wasn't long after our production that the um, Israeli government sort of negotiated some conditions under which they could tear down the theater. So there'd be no public forum um, of this nature for Palestinians to present their art. And um, um, Roger Waters had donated the sound system to the, to the theater and we got in there right after they got this new beautiful sound system and we were able to do like a real full-scale production but unfortunately the theater only survived another few months so that night i took out the israeli character changed the play in other ways that they wanted um the translator translated in the morning you know i think she started around six was done at nine for uh for rehearsal and the actors read it and i said okay they do it and so then we moved forward Okay, so then I proposed this play to the actors at Dolar Arts and they wouldn't do this play either because they said that they didn't want to be perceived as being sympathetic to Palestinians either because they said that too could get them in trouble and could land them in jail. So then without a play to do, Jesus and I, who is the stage manager for our production, we decided together to write a play that was largely a movement based piece, but that would have dialogue, much of which we developed after we got there. And so we put together this piece that turned out to be super successful and we had a really wonderful production. And um, it was really very much post-dramatic in that there's no, um, no dialogue really between any characters. Um, it's sort of presentational and poetic and um, it's intermedial and in that we involved a lot of different design elements together with equal value. And um, we created you know, a piece that we were all really excited about in the end. And then it was called No Erasure means it's, it's about censorship. It's about people's inability to express themselves, yeah. you know, under certain constraints, either self-imposed because of guilt, shame, and anxiety that they've experienced or trauma and so forth, or because they're governmental institutions that work to oppress them in various ways. And so um, what we did is we had a, a performance where everything's kind of simultaneously articulated and disarticulated at the same time. Yeah. You know, so movement and choreography that gets stumped in the movement where things stop and get stalled, where actors try to speak, but we bleep them out, um, or they become aphasic or, you know, word salad and so forth. And it ended up to kind of a William Bur Burrowsian kind of cut up. And, um, you know, I was, in the end, I was really happy with it. And so what, um, what then Mark and I will do, like with Navasala in our book, is that um, we write about the project, the impact, you know, um, the whole experience from a kind of immersive ethnographic perspective, but a collaborative, you know, from a position as collaborators with the artists with whom we're studying, 
And um, so in this case, I haven't written, written on this yet because we've just finished, but we'll talk about the whole experience and the process and then the impact that it had, you know, how it was received by the audience and, and sort of that kind of thing. Yeah, so this drama that you're talking about, the production of this drama, when exactly was that? Was that a, a, a pre, pre-pandemic or, uh, or very recently? Oh, it's just, we just got back. You just so, got back. And, yeah, the uh, show so, went up on, so on April 10th. Okay, and so we are in May of 2001. So this is the drama of immediacy because uh, we are right now in the middle of yet well, a lot of uh, a lot of CNN footage of uh, things that are uh, going on now in Israel and. and oh, if, if you're yeah. talking about the project um, Navasala and the Janine refugee camp, you know, in Janine, we yeah. did that back in um, 2015. That was 2015. It was over a year yeah. project, 2014-15. I saw some erasure. Was just we just did this last month. Yeah, I saw some footage. What I want to do is try to anchor this. I want to return to the Middle East, but I want to try to anchor this in your career because you start out, you uh, at, you, you uh, graduated Harvard, you were into post-structural theory, and we'll talk a little more about your background. You were also a motocross, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, you, uh, but before you got into the... Uh, the, the heavy cognition, but you might argue, I think you would argue that motocross is heavy cognition too. You got to have your wits about you all the time. And uh, I see this, these two uh, seemingly contradictory strains running toward uh, in your life that are actually together immediacy and what we contend uh, usually see as a kind of interface cognition type world that a lot of our colleagues may live in. We talk about semiotics and post-structuralism and so forth, but you came out, wrote on that. Uh, uh, your, your focus was on Shakespeare and still is on Shakespeare. And uh, the, you have related Shakespeare, not only to post-structuralist theory, but to uh, I'm thinking of one example in Othello, the, the drama of immediacy of uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, the key word in your theory is transversal. The, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm gathering the movement from one state to another in, in terms of discourse, time and space. And you have talked about that in several Shakespearean plays. And you have kind of gone from that into the actual theater as an actual actor, a producer, a playwright yourself. And right now we're catching you at a point of your career where you are doing the, the immediate. Uh, so you, you've kind of gone a little bit beyond Shakespeare. Although I, I wanted our audience to know that the, all of this has a, a sort of foundational uh, Shakespeare. Part, yeah, that's no problem at all. I've got an electronic desk here. We're rising. <laughs> um, so I wanted to to anchor this a bit in Shakespearean studies for the program, for the purposes of the program, and to show how this is now, um, how Shakespeare is, is sort of foundational to the sort of work that you're doing now with uh, the drama of immediacy and what you're calling, um, well, the mediation, the um, medial uh, elements of, of drama. How, uh, what I'm assuming is through dramatic expression and performance how so you how certain conflicts particularly in the middle east perhaps could be remedied would that be the ultimate goal do you think um let me just uh address a few things he said yeah um, i'll just like i'll start by just talking about my other main area of research yeah let's do last, that maybe mm -hmm. um i guess maybe the last seven years yeah, yeah. Is I've been researching um, like sort of high risk action sports. Yeah. And I became interested in looking at that, having done action sports my whole life, um, motorcycle, motocross primarily. You know, I tried to make it as a professional motocross racer, had a lot of injuries, including a serious spinal cord injury, which makes it so that I can't type. I, um, I write by voice with voice recognition software. Um, but I'm not going to go down a whole hill with any of injuries and stuff, but lots of broken bones, you know, about 14 or 15 or so and traction and all kinds, you know, everything you can think of. Um, the, um, so I, that'd been a big part of my life before it became a, you know, an academic or a student. And, um, and I continued with that and it was only about 
about 10 years ago, I'm trying to do this really quickly. About 10 years ago, um, I was getting my kids into skiing. And you know, I've always been a you know a big mountain freestyle skier since I was a kid, but I've taken many years off from doing anything really just because I was pursuing my academic career, doing other stuff and trying to avoid injury. And then I was teaching my kids how to ski and my father-in-law came with us and I got sort of one chance to go off and ski by myself. And, and then he came trailing after me and I managed to, I was down and going down this run that had a lot of, you know, you know, sort of medium sized sort of jumps and stuff and a lot of things that I could hit and it'd been a while. And anyway, he fell and broke his neck Ooh. and um, sort of trailing after me. And he, you know, had to be helicoptered to the hospital and he was sort of temporarily uh, quadriplegic. And then they did a series of operations. Then he became, you know, you know, um, functional in every way except for one arm, and um, and some other some other issues, and had a plate put in his neck and stuff. And it was at that time that I kind of started thinking about injury and coming back from injury and all the injuries that I'd come back from, and how vulnerable we are in this context, and how like what level of performance we achieve is action sports people in terms of proprioceptive awareness, the flow state, the coordination, the brain you know, how you connect everything up, the kind of universalizing that you have to achieve, how people progress, how visualization plays into it. And I started thinking about people in conflict zones and how they, um, you know, sort of deal with their everyday circumstances with regard to trauma, duress, the constraints, all the kinds of things that people have to be aware of, or even navigating like traffic in some countries in which I work is just incredible. Like how do you even cross the street is amazing, like in Cairo. So, I got this idea then that I wanted to start um, looking at um, the subcultures around um, certain action sports in terms of codification, branding, aesthetics, um, progression, ideology, the philosophy, all these things and how they might connect up to performance and typical performance studies ways or in ethnographic research and, and just see what kind of questions they might sort of put into play. And really about play. This is really about play, right? About indeterminacy and interstitial play and you know how we can change things. But this is at a different level than thinking about it, you know, um, cognitively. So I started, I narrowed down, instead of doing motocross, um, since I'm not doing motocross anymore, I decided to limit it to um, mountain biking, skiing, and skateboarding, mm -hmm. all sports that I do regularly. In my house here, we have two skateboard half pipes. We have one outside and we have one inside. And, um, and I, we have mountain bike trails. We have 70 miles of trails right outside the door here. So I'm always out riding and I try to get like, you know, at least maybe 30 days of skiing in each year since I started getting back into it back when that happened. So um, I just- yeah, you, you have a half, half, half pipe in, inside your house that I- Yeah, we do. We have one in my son's bedroom. Um, in fact, the, it, the ramp opens up into a bed. So the only way we could get the, get the ramp in the house, given the space that we have, is to actually put his bed inside the ramp. Nowhere so, is safe. <laughs> Nowhere. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's worked out fine. We only had one kid go through the window, but it wasn't um, it wasn't why he was skating. It was why they were goofing off wrestling. Yeah. Um, I think one kid did a karate kick into the kid and he went flying out the window. But otherwise, it's been fine. Um, <laughs> the, um, that my house, the floors are all polished concrete, so you can skate right through the house. And I'm sure you do. <laughs> Everyone does. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. I mean, the, uh, the borders, the, the borders that we normally place with uh, inside, outside, you know, that's big in Japanese culture also, the, right. whether you're outside or in, no borders over uh, the, <laughs> at, Brian, of course, at, we have at the Brian's board. place. And, yeah, we have a trampoline too. And, you yeah. know, and basically you can sort of skate or do whatever you want through the house and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> So, the, so I may just go do this kind of, I mean, I don't know if there's any really quick way to do this because now- I'm No, no, take your time. Take, we we have time. set up for yeah. talking about the, the theory. Yeah. But so what happened with this project and um, I'm just going to give a quick overview and I'll get more into some, some concepts. Yeah. Is that I started to get really interested in like what role gratitude plays, you know, like just um, being grateful for the world in which we live and for nature and being outside. And like um, how pro-social, um, I really, my focus started to shift toward just big mountain skiers. Um, 
those are people that ski like um, maybe backcountry terrain, the hike out, or they ski maybe by um, you know by helicopter or cat. You know, they go out um, and tour. They, it's called ski touring when you go hiking and skiing, um, as well as freestyle skiers. But usually there's some relationship between the two. You know, you develop your skills so you can take them out on bigger terrain. And this is something that I've, I've done for years and I've got really heavily back into it in order to develop this project. To get the project off the ground, I contacted Free Skier Magazine, which is the leading ski magazine for freestyle and big mountain. And they took me on board as a staff writer. And so that way I would keep the research going. And then I started really just got to know all the different pro skiers and tried to go helicopter skiing with them up in Alaska, up in BC. And um, really had to get myself into the community, like really like a real ethnographer, although it's not my field, you know, had to really just, be, you know, become a part of the community before I could really come to understand what people are up to. And then I was fortunate enough to meet a, a cognitive neuroscientist who works on trauma and, um, and a lot of different neurological disorders. And I shared with her what I was doing. Her name is Amal Lakar. She's here at UCI. And what we... Um, what we've kind of hypothesized is that the brains of big mountain, you know, extreme skiers and other extreme athletes are different from everyone else and that they have different dopamine receptors. And as we started looking at resilience, perseverance, um, fearlessness, and it's sort of like seeing are there different predispositions for these um, kind of character traits. And we're starting to see that there are. So what we did is we set up a lab here on campus with mice. And so we've been doing all these work with mice, trying to set up similar kinds of environments and experiments with them to see like um, to what extent um, they'll take, like ones that have these receptors will take risks while others won't, how calculated they are. Also what we found is that people that tend to be higher risk taking, but also more resilient and persevering are also more pro-social and that they have more fidelity to their friends. They won't just go away, like the mouse won't leave the mouse that's with to seek a new mouse if it has these receptors, while a mouse that doesn't just goes to the new mouse. Does right. leave the, the ones with the receptors is leave no mouse behind. Leave no, exactly. It's leave no okay, mouse behind. Okay, yeah. Really and fascinating. I, I, this is making me think about Hamlet a bit, because <laughs> I, I was just teaching this last week in the in terms of hamlet being so hard on himself for being lily livered and lacking courage you know that soliloquy and he does this a couple of times where he just despises himself of course the self-loathing and his lack of courage and his inability to act yet he's absolutely on the ghost against the warnings of his friends his, his friend horatio tries to hold him back marcellus tries to hold him back and he he insists he's going to follow that ghost mm -hmm. which arguably is the most courageous thing to do i mean yes. these, these people yeah. are trained warriors right you know they're uh, not trained in talking to ghosts or in uh so uh i i think that that's that it, it's interesting what that type of work you're doing is interesting and also there might be ser several levels of courage Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can <laughs> you, you, you can find some people who are perfectly willing to jump out of a or jump off the side of a mountain and throw up a parachute with their hand. Right. Or mm -hmm. other people who who would never do that. Or are you seeing anything like that? Well, let me just sort of, um, let me kind of get into sort of the kind of nuts and bolts of transversal yeah. theory and transversal poetics. Yeah. But I'd yeah. like to use a few different examples to illustrate um, this and one of which can be Hamlet. Yeah. And so let's just take for a moment that, um, I'll put this idea out there and then I'll bring it to the skiers and then I'll just talk about sort of transversality in everyday life. Okay. So Hamlet is exposed to what seems like a ghost, right? You know, what, what the ghost is, is not is yet to be determined. But there's a figure that seems otherworldly, has a supernatural quality to it. Um, so it's unfamiliar. What Hamlet tries to do, like we all try to do, is turn the unfamiliar into something familiar. We relate that thing, let's say, to our experience with like things in the past. This is the same thing we do with words. When someone's speaking, we relate the words to the other times we've encountered those words in the past and then retroactively recontextualize them in the interest of making sense of them. We want to make sense of them in the first instance in the interest of self-preservation, right? First, we want to make sure we're safe, right? Then after that, there's, you know, the familiarization can continue, however real or imaginary. 
in the interest of kind of developing rapport sometimes with someone, liking, comprehension, you know, and maybe the bottom line becomes happiness, but it begins with self-preservation. So the making sense, kind of the impulse to make sense is self-preserving in a sense, right? Because we need to understand the environment in which you're operating. So Hamlet is now exposed to the ghost. Um, he wants to sort of, he, this is something unfamiliar that he wants to make familiar in order to make sense of it. The most familiar quality to the ghost is that it resembles his father, right? And this is, might be part of what makes him move closer to it than somebody else might. You know, because there's a familiarity there, something maybe, you know, something essential that he registers as dad like. So that might be part of you, because you could say, on the one hand, it's really courageous, but on the other hand, this might be the thing that becomes the entree into, for him to move further, go deeper. Mm -hmm. So let's just say you're walking down the street and somebody's walking towards you. Let's say it's at night. And so when you see that person coming, you're the only people on the street, depending on where you are, there's a lot of variables. So that figure is unfamiliar and you want to make it familiar through your basic registers and previous experiences with other people and stories you've heard about encountering people while walking down the street. You might see how they walk. You know, if they're walking like this, you know, you might be more concerned than if they're just walking in a way that's familiar. You know, if they're walking on your side of the street and not moving or coming directly towards you or crossing the street to come towards you, you know, that might be more, a greater concern. As, as they come into focus, you'll read their clothing, you know, their codifications, you know, all the things that you would read just to assess whether they're a threat to you or not. So we're doing this all the time. We're reading the codes. Okay, so now let me just take this idea of reading codes for a moment and bring it over to Big Mountain Skiing. Okay. So let's say that if you're um, on the top of the mountain, you know, you get out of the heli, you're standing there, you're looking down at this, you know, huge line, you know you're going to be going roughly 65 miles an hour. Um, there's no stopping once you start. You know you have to go. There's, you know there's, you, you might think of your various. You always think of a couple exit plans. You know a plan B and you know and C. Um, if avalanche starts, the train is variable. It's not what you expect. You can't assess all the all the factors, which is one of the great things about being out skiing is that the train is ultimately indeterminate. You know, you don't know if there's a crevasse there or what's, what's, what you're going to encounter. Um, okay, so you start, you drop, and then usually a, a skier thinks of their ability, a way to, by which to measure their ability is how far away from their skis they can look. The further you can look away from your skis, usually the more advanced skier you are. Because what you're doing is you're reading in all the codes really quickly. And so your awareness is such that you reach this flow state where you're just sort of moving at one with the environment and you're responding super fast. So you don't have to think about what you're doing. In fact, it's crucial that you don't. In fact, you have to remember to forget. So usually skiers have something ritualistic they do, just like skaters before they drop in to do a, do a trick, is that they remember to forget. And for skiers, sometimes they click their, their boots or their poles or they look away and they come back or they have a little mantra or something that they say. It's something to clear, just like an actor does before going on stage to perform. There's a moment of clearing that happens so you can really fully move into the process of embodying your character or whatever it is that you're you know, hoping to accomplish there. So the skier does that too. Then he or she drops in and then things start to intensify. So I wanna just talk for a moment about a few basic um, uh, transversal concepts. Okay. So, and there's a bunch of different ways in which I, I can do this. But let me just say that um, uh, that I imagine that everyone exists. I even go back a little further. I see, I see everyone as being an organic entity, right? Insofar as we um, um, individuate from others, like acknowledge that um, objects and creatures are different from us, there's an individuation process that takes place. Um, insofar as we become member of a community, you know, we're um, subjectified into a particular belief system, you know, through guilt, shame, and anxiety, and other factors, you know, ideological inculcation through educational apparatuses, what I call social political conductors, um, church, family, you know, educational institutions, and so forth, legal institutions. Um, and so then you become a subject within that community. And then insofar as you abide by the rules of that community, that determines whether you're a good or bad citizen. So crucial to this sort of inculcation, subjectification is the establishment of what I call your subjective territory. 
This is your conceptual, emotional, and physical lens through which you experience. It's the scope of your experience. It's fluid and moving. You know, everyone has their own subjective territory. And it's um it's idiosyncratic, but with commonalities. And it's over through these overlap, our shared interest in theater, or maybe in Hamlet, which is a subspace, a theater space, and so forth, creates official territories into which we become more invested. Um, the more beneficial they are for us, usually community makes it more beneficial because self-preservation first. If you have community, you have a tribe, you know, by which to protect yourself. So then you develop rules around the community to give it stability. So we have various official territories that are the overlappings of our subjective territories that mutually reinforce each other. And the way they get kind of negotiated is through what I call social political conductors. Those are people with authoritative power in different contexts. Some people are powerful in one context while they mean nothing in another context. I mean, you could be an authoritative figure at the university, but as soon as you go into the local garage, nobody will might care what you have to say. Right, so we're we're social political conductors in different contexts. Everyone is, you know, to greater or lesser degrees. And what social political conductors do is they negotiate discourse. So discourse sort of happens. Let's say like the recent, um, you know, uh, uh, war between you know uh, Gaza and, and Israel. So right now, that's a, there's a discourse around that, and people will will mobilize it, appropriate it, co-opt it in the interest of their own politics. You know, they'll, they'll keep shifting it. Um, just like we've just had four years of Trump discourse, you know, we might yeah. call Trump space or, yeah. and so people sort of, you know, um, harness that, move it, negotiate it. And so this is what social political conductors do in the interest of whatever ideology they're hoping to support. Yeah, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, right. What if we green? What if we green screen the entire current uh, uh, conflict between uh, Gaza and Israel, which is big in the news right now as we speak? If we green screen, uh, screen that and just took it out of all of the narratives, what what would happen? What would happen if nobody paid attention? What do you think? If the, if it could somehow be dialed down to nothing no narrative if nobody paid attention outside of israel and and gaza um yeah something like outside or i'm thinking just if people stopped caring other than people well, who were immediately hurt well uh, israel would just wipe out every single living person in gaza that would happen oh yeah yeah if if the world wasn't watching it would just be annihilation Against the only the, thing keeping against Palestinians the, alive is, <laughs> is that people are watching. Against the will of many Israelis. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah, a systemic, I mean, there's a systemic machine, destruction machine, you're saying mm -hmm. that would work pretty much as it's if we were thinking of in terms of AI or something like that. It's 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 built to work the way it's going to work if it's not held back, regardless of a, a social consensus within the the society the, well there doesn't have to be consensus within society just only those in power um yeah. have to you know, are you know need to make a decision yeah right yeah. and in this case you know the, the zionists in power would eliminate palestinians that's, so, that's just like, yeah, I don't think this is pretty straightforward. Yeah, and it's not like anyone's um, tried to, you know, cover that. You know, it's not equivocal. Yeah, it's, you know, this is this is the platform on which Zionism, you know, presents itself. Well, I, I ask about this because my wife asked me the other days, "What side are you on?" And she said, "Are you on the American side?" I said, "I don't get up in the morning and read state." State Department uh, policies on Israel. I, I don't. I don't. I don't really have a side any more than I have a side. We were in Barcelona uh, before the pandemic for a period. I was on sabbatical. Uh, there's there's a separatist movement in uh, uh, Catalonia, and I, I, it's not me. It's not my world. I, I see both sides. I see the uh, Castellano side. I see the uh, the uh, Catalan Catalan side. I see the side of the Scottish separatist movement and so forth. Then none of those, uh, and there are probably others out there. Do people feel like they have to take a side, right? And I'm trying to bring this back to your actors who are so Im immediately sensitive to 
what might seem to be someone taking a side in a drama that's trying to to obliterate this idea of the of the um, what the oppositional nature, the polar nature of these things, and humanize it and bring it into uh, a, a more complex and more a real understanding of the situation. So this particular one in the Middle East, here I am, waspish boy from the American South. Uh, I'm supposed to have a position on this, whereas in Spain, no one expects me to have a position, you know, other than- I see, right. You see- it's Given your context, people have an expectation. Yeah. And because they think that you're somehow perhaps more personally invested because of where you're from, yeah, you know, that you should have something to say about something as if they don't have a responsibility to other yeah. people in the world too. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. I know nothing. I know yeah. nothing. I, I don't speak Hebrew. I, I know yeah. nothing really about mm -hmm. Israel, and and I've never been there. And I, I uh, and one thing I find absent in news and news coverage is people talking to Palestinians and people talking to Isra Israelis. We hear well, leaders, what's, and, um, and, which I think really sort of crucial. Um, you know, in transversal terms to what you're saying is that is process and what I refer to as becomings and comings to be. So if I go back to what I was talking about with subjective territory, like you occupy your subjective territory, it's fluid. I occupy a subjective territory also. Um, in the interest of sharing ideas with you, I undergo a becomings Tom, right? I'm becomings you. If I'm driving my car into an intersection, I'm undergoing a becomings all the variables I imagined, you know, um, of significance within the intersection. I filter out the noise and I focus on what's most important. Maybe this bicycle are coming a little too fast. You know, this person in the car that looks like they're texting. You know, what's happening? I tried to take into consideration all the variables that are kind of becomings the environment is a way by which to best negotiate it, right? And ultimately to navigate it. So when we're trying to share ideas, we're doing a becomings each other. This happens while I'm walking down the street in Cairo. I'm trying to understand to the best of my ability, like the like countless people around me in cars and vehicles and things, you know, in the interest of self-preservation. Then when I get to the rehearsal space, you know, and we're talking about ideas, I'm trying to become the actors, you know, to try to understand each of them individually and collectively to see how it is what I'm sharing relates to their own personal life experiences. But at the same time, what's happening is what I call comings to be. So I'm willfully moving in your direction, right? It's uh, becomings Tom to share what it is I'm trying to share with you. Um, it's sort of in a way that I think would be comprehensible. At the same time, you're saying things. We have a we have a feedback loop potentially taking place, right? And so, to the extent that maybe you have what I call emulative authority, you know, maybe like you say things with greater authority than I anticipate or imagined. I'll start to be swayed into your direction, mm -hmm. you know, where I'll start coming to be you, you know, this happens in every conversation. There's a negotiation between becomings and comings to be mm -hmm. for me. What I call goings is when it's non-volitional, you know, like becomings begins, um, you know, it's volitional comings to be too can be volitional. Like, let's say that I want to become a member of the Southern California surf community. So I'll start surfing. Most importantly, you got to surf. Um, <laughs> But I'll walk and talk like a surfer, you know, I hang out with surfers, you know, I'll speak the sort of slang of surfers. And then let's say I go in for a corporate or academic job interview and I say like, right on dude, I refer to a girl as a chick, then my sort of becoming surfer in a sense, transition to a comings to be surfer such that it overrode my becomings academic or corporate. Like in other words, this wouldn't be what would be expected or be appropriate within this interview. Should me should I speak that way? But the the power of the surfer um, was more powerful than the than the academic or corporate in this case. So we have different sort of um, forces of becomings and comings to be that are more powerful than others, giving the context in which we're operating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll just take a little further. So if we go back to the skier coming down the mountain he or she is becomings the environment. You know, ideally not comings to be the environment, like should an avalanche occur and you're all of a sudden taken in and under. Um, in order to, to sort of navigate any space in terms of becomings and comings to be, we have to operate in what I call subjunctively. You have to imagine the what ifs and as ifs. When you go into the intersection or you encounter the person walking down the street, you, you operate um, 
as if they're safe, as if you the cars are going to follow the speed limit, as if they're going to stop at the light, as if they're not going to cross the yellow line, right? But you also have to consider what if they do, right? So you're simultaneously thinking the as ifs and what ifs is the becomings and comings to be are occurring, you know, hopefully no goings where you're going to move non volitionally And if you're going out of control, then you're moving transversally. So ideally through our lives, we sort of, um, we have feedback loops that affirm for us our safety and maybe other things that are important to us. Um, but at the same time, we thrive on the unexpected. This is why people like surprise so much, is that surprise releases dopamine. Learning involves surprise because you wouldn't be learning if you weren't encountering something new. So therefore there's a dopamine release. So in fact, learning gets us high in a sense. When you're skiing a line and you're skiing down the mountain, you want it to be predictable, but you simultaneously don't want it to be. You want to linger on the brink of unpredictability so you can get those dopamine releases, you get those surprises and they feel good. And so really quickly you get boom, 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 fast uptake, lots of dopamine, a lot of feel good. And then you get the amazing sense of release at the end, you know, this kind of catharsis in this sense, but it's not ideational, it's more sort of embodied. And then maybe you have a wonderful oxytocin, you know, kind of, um, you know, indulgence because you've survived. And this might be the experience to some extent that we get after passing through every crazy intersection in a city like Cairo or Delhi or, you know, or, you know, Calcutta or wherever that, you know, just every day walking down the street to some extent until it becomes sort of um, normalized. And when things become more normalized in a sense, then people often look for other opportunities for learning and for surprise and for dopamine release and for excitement. But there are also those people that don't want those things. They want to stay in kind of, um, you know, have a more routed experience, you know, one where life is predictable and safe. And, you know, for, for whatever reason, people have all kinds of reasons for this. And it, begs, it breaks down the kind of basic kind of um, neurochemical response. And so far as like, let's say you go to the gym to get big muscles. In the first few weeks, you're going to show big gains because your body's responding to something that's not typical. So it's trying to compensate in a way for what the brain can't do. If you don't vary your exercises, you eventually start to have diminishing returns because building muscle mass ultimately is compensation for what your brain can't do. Okay, so let's say you have these feedback um, loops that affirm for you your experience. You know, they maybe um, um, make valid all kinds of things that are, you know, that are crucial to your understanding of your life experience. Um, maybe they also allow for a certain amount of surprise and dopamine release like within the structure of theater. But what if you have what I call feed forward flow? That's when things slip out out of control and you can't, you can't, you don't get the loop. You start reeling. You have to sort of take into consideration other variables. You have to move more investigative expansively. You have to sort of keep moving out. So I imagine that we have roughly four kinds of consciousness. We have our quotidian consciousness, which is like our everyday consciousness, like kind of what we're experiencing right now. Then we might have what I would call, um, you know, a pause consciousness, you know, that you sometimes you, you forget where you are in space and time, like you're coming home from work and your wife calls and says, Tom, remember to pick up the beers. Um, you get home and there's no beer. She's like, where's the beers? And you're like, oh, I just came home because you slip <laughs> right back into that regular consciousness. Yeah. But then other times, like maybe like in this discussion, we're exercising to some degree our reflexive consciousness. We're thinking about ourselves thinking. You know, we're being more aware. But really what I'm interested in most of all in this context is what I call our, our motor consciousness. So let's say you're skiing that line. Or let's say you're in a conversation with somebody that's pretty heated and different ideas are coming at you so quickly that you can't comprehend them. People often shut down. Or let's say you're being exposed to like really radical cultural differences. Or let's say you find yourself in a combat situation that you didn't anticipate. Everything's just sort of gone south. Mm -hmm. What happens is you're not able to sort of process. The feedback loops are sort of unsustainable. The mm -hmm. feed forward flow starts mm -hmm. to take over. Then we start to, your motor consciousness kicks in. It starts to filter out all the, un, what you believe to be all the unnecessary data and really focusing on the things that are most important. What I call your visceral electrics or your visceral electritudes amplify. That means it's visceral, it's intellectual, it's electric. You totally kick in. You're going down the mountain. You've got to kick in viscerelectrically. Right, in order to keep negotiating the trees, the rocks, the jumps, the space, you know, gravity, all these different things, all the elements, the density of snow. You're in a situation where you're in a protest and all of a sudden people start firing on you. 
You know, like all of a sudden the situation's now changed radically. You have to figure out where you're going to go, where you're going to, how you're going to seek cover. What are you going to do if you get hit? You know, all kinds of things can you have to take into consideration. So it becomes more viscerelectric. As the viscerelectritudes kind of amplify, it starts to transition to what I call the fractalactic. Things start breaking apart, and they start you start pulling them together at the same time. This could happen when you're having a spiritual experience where you feel a kind of dissipation or oneness or universalizing, you know, through meditation or through a mantra or something, you start coming apart, but you also start pulling it together. So it's both fractalizing and galactic. It's fractal and galactic, pulling itself together. And of course, I, I, is I, um, a point I make in one of my performance pieces, if it feels really good, well, then it's fractalicious. lingers on no tickle when tickle transitions into touch plain old touch no one wants to be plain give me pain give me pain anticipation depends on previous experience with the experience virtual or actual if one has not had an orgasm he cannot anticipate it properly but he can know when it happens the same goes for tickling and for pain the force of the whip the burning cigarette against virgin skin. Don't be shy. Relax. Don't worry. It will hurt a lot. <laughs> well, okay, so I am now trying to, you're talking about the, the, the four areas of consciousness within life. What do you, uh, what or say some of your goals or what would you like to do in terms of how the actual stage interacts with this theater that you've set up in the quotidian world? I think that you're kind of saying that basically day-to-day -day life can be sort of a theater. So how would a stage play that you're writing uh, how would that interact with the other things that are going in or wish to interact with the other things that are going on uh, in, let's just call it for now, the real world as mm -hmm. a, the stage world? Well, I think that like any um, performance or mode of expression that kind of resonates powerfully, and that's, of course, you hope that it will with any audience, that um, it kind of takes on what Derrida refers to as supplementarity. You know, it becomes something that fills into a structure. You know, it's ephemeral. You know, it'll be there for a little while, but it becomes what I call an articulatory space. Articulation means the coming together of disparate things. So these things come together, you know, like shape space is my space for Shakespeare. You know, the space is the articulatory space where discourses sort of interact where they get appropriated and sort of they get mobilized and then they dissipate and move on. And other things are pulled into it, like Trump space or now the Gaza-Israel war space. You know, these things come and they go and they often overlap and they relate to each other. So we have an articulatory space. So at the time that you're putting on a theater production, that becomes an articulatory space for those people involved and exposed to it. You know, this is a more, it's more microcosmic, but that articulatory space is informed by other discourses outside. You know, people are going to come to an experience and relate whatever is going on in their own life to whatever it is that they're seeing. You know, and inevitably everyone's coming, you know, like Roland Barthes says, you know, the death of the author is the birth of the reader. Well, I think in this case, the, um, the performance itself 
you know, it, it puts out data to which people respond, but they're going to create what they want to create or not necessarily what they want to create. They're going to create something reactively in relation to it. Yeah. So well, I'm, me, I'm thinking about the, the Shakespearean period. Shakespeare avoided the theater, apparently uh, avoided prison, apparently. And a lot of his contemporaries did not. Several of his contemporaries famously were thrown into prison because of an interpretation of what they had done. Now, I want to move this up to what you're doing and go back in our conversation to these actors who really did not want to perform because yeah. I'm assuming what was a what the the uh, play was attempting to express would be misread the space or whatever. All of that would be misread maybe by a bunch of people playing checkers rather than chess and that they would actually go from a dramatic situation to a situation where their lives might be in danger because yes. of misinterpretation. Yeah. Right. I'm glad you brought that back. Yeah. Um, when I, when I talked about how any given work is going to be within a dynamic with the audience, um, I think that as a theater maker, you, you know, in this context, you have a responsibility to your actors and everyone involved to sort of um, kind of calculate, like really calculate, you know, the risk, just the way, uh, uh, you know, a high level skier calculates all the variables and comes up with an exit plan and so forth. And usually if they feel adrenaline, they don't do it. You know, or if anything suggests you don't do it, you don't do it, right? You just follow your intuition because you may not know why you think you shouldn't do it, but you're you're reading codes that you may not be able to understand yourself. I think in this case, the actors were, um, they were reading codes actually familiar to them is that, you know, I think since the new government's been in power, roughly, you know, 40,000 people have disappeared. So, and they don't want to be among them. And so what we tried to do in this case was create, I think we're a little bit ambitious with the Holocaust play with Railroad, you know, because we were being a little too, potentially too provocative, but the artistic directors of this um, theater have a lot of chutzpah and they thought we could really do something interesting and get a really good debate going over some very serious issues. The actors put the brakes on and said, but we're the ones who are probably going to be hauled off to jail. And so we're not going to do it. So it's with the new a production, bit too, a little bit too immediate for us. Uh, too immediate, right? Yeah. But it was the new production was an example of what I call theater of immediacy, and that it became urgent and emergent under the circumstances. And the idea was to make the play kind of amorphous enough that it would be difficult for censors to say what the play was directly about. Yes, and you're asking these actors to jump to jump down the mountain mm -hmm. to mediate that space themselves. They have to have yes. number one. We have to, of course, relate the, the courage that it requires to stand on a stage in front of people. There, there are people out there who never feel a sense of anxiety about that. I've, I've talked to those people, but right. I think they're rare. I think that some of the great actors and some of the most uh, uh, well-received actors in one case i and i'm trying to remember the name very famous actor talked about doing uh willie uh during the death of a salesman and said that he his first night opening night he walked out onto the stage to tell the crowd that he couldn't do it he'd forgotten all of his lines and he just couldn't do it and as soon as he got out there he just started talking and the whole thing came everything just came in and it, uh, when you were talking about going down that ski slope how you 
you somehow meld with that with the world and that's that transversal moment i think i'm giving an, an example of that where you you belong to the entire uh scape of whatever you're in you're mm -hmm. asking actors to do that to have the courage to do that and also be cuffed up and arrested maybe before they get through the play right i mean unlike actors typically going on stage where they're not being arrested is not something that they need to take consideration in this case it's not just being arrested it's also being arrested jailed and tortured um the um I guess maybe we did lose an, act, an actor after the first day of rehearsal. So, by, um, by lose, what do you mean? Meaning that he said he didn't want to do the show. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, which uh, it wasn't really exactly clear as to why that he decided not to do it. But I think he was concerned about how the play was going to be interpreted. Because um, he had expressed some concern. And, um, and then afterwards he said, you know, I'm not feeling totally comfortable with the production. And I'm just, you know, I think it's better for me if I don't do it, which is, you know, we've totally respected that and, you know, and just adapted. Um, so, I mean, when working in, that's a whole nother kind of discussion I could go into, but when working in, um, in, in places that are conflict zones, I wouldn't say that Cairo is really a conflict zone by, you know, any strict definition, but in other places where I have worked, um, where uh, there's a lot of unpredictable variables that come up, you know, like, just the typical kind of things that we take for granted, like an actor showing up for rehearsal because nobody beat the shit out of them at home, yeah. you know, um, isn't something that is, that's something that you can easily encounter um, in other places where we work. Yeah. You know, like you don't know what's gonna happen. You can't even be sure that even the day that the show opens that everyone's gonna be there because of stuff they're contending with. I mean, we did a we did a project in Zanzibar in Tanzania two years ago with children. We did um, these pieces that were based on the stories that children told us, like children by you know all the way up to the age of seventeen, starting at like eight to seven or nine to seventeen roughly, and they told us stories about corruption and abuse within their communities. And the idea was to create theater works, and we created six of them that where they could tell the community what had happened to them. So we listened to their stories. We made two trips to Zanzibar, you know, over a year period, um, collected their stories. Then I wrote plays based on the stories, you know, in collaboration with them. And then we went and we produced them where they performed for their communities and sort of told stories about what had happened to them. Sometimes they were kind of mashups, you know, as a way to get the ideas out there that, that they couldn't share with the members of their community, not even their parents, by other means. You know, this became the, and, the, and the interesting thing is they'd never done theater before. This is the first time any of the kids had done theater. You know, they're familiar with television, but they had never seen theater or made theater before. And yeah. since we left there in 2019, now doing sort of um, some theater work has become a regular part of their educational program with the Zanzibar Learning for Life Foundation with whom we collaborated. Interestingly, also give you another example. It's like last year I went to Kabul, uh, Afghanistan, to go to this um, work with this organization called the Miraculous Love Kids. And what they are is um, they're a group, a really like phenomenal, just extraordinary institution run by one person named Lanny Cardola, who was a sort of former American rock and roller. He was a member of the band called the Vanilla Fudge. Uh -huh. them that's going a while back. He's played with a number of other bands, worked in the studio work with Thumbs and Roses and the Beach Boys and all kinds of groups. And he was working in Afghanistan, I'm sorry, sorry, in Pakistan with uh, Janoon, which is a, um, a major Pakistani um, you know, rock band. And they were recording in the theater, in the studio flooded. Um, and so he just thought, what am I gonna do now? Cause here I am, um, we can't do any work cause we've got a you know, uh, destroyed studio. So he decided to go to Kabul and find the girl in the Life magazine photo that was a survivor after a Taliban bombing that had killed several members of her family, um, including her parents and um, sister and stuff. And then he went there, found her and found her remaining family members and decided that he really wanted to do something to help them. So he came back to the US and he raised $10,000, came back there to buy them a home and stuff and you know give them support. But then when he got there, he realized there's so many kids whose parents had been killed by the Taliban. 
particularly girls who really have no prospects, they're very likely going to be sex trafficked and, um, and abused in other ways and married off and their lives look really grim. So he decided that he would set up a, a guitar school for girls um, called the Miraculous Love Kids. And that, I mean, at great risk, literally what Lanny did was approach girls in parks throughout selling stuff. Um, say with a translator, say that, would you be interested in a school where you learn English? Because his idea was to teach them English and other life skills. And then he would pay their families, whoever's taking care of them, to let them go to the school. And then he'd get a number of, um, of moms to come and be there every day, you know, and sort of like help out and supervise. I mean, he had this whole idea in his mind that he was going to do this. And then he had to find a space to do this in, in Kabul. And I have to tell you, it's pretty gnarly there. And to find a space to work in, especially as a Westerner, is like it's no easy task. And then he sort of connected with Raven Ray Resources, which is a paramilitary group that provides security for, um, you know, for corporate people and anyone who needs it. And they said they provide security for him pro bono and, um, and that they would every day go and pick up the girls in their Humvees. You know, they have these fortified vehicles and they'd go around the city with their soldiers, pick up the girls so they'd be safe, bring them to his school so that he could teach them and then take them home each day. And that Lanny would stay in their compound where I stayed which is surrounded by blast walls with airlock, with tarps, no drone attacks, with usually 20 soldiers on duty all the time. With um, all, you, Throughout the whole complex, they have these steel doors that lock at six points. They have a whole canine division. They have you know, CCTV everywhere. You know, they have a safe space, safe room. I mean, the place was just amazing. And so they, they helped Mark and I out while we were there. And so we went there with the idea is we'll make a music video with the girls to help promote them. So our plan was to get them into a recording studio. I mean, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys had made a video with them, but he did it remotely. So yeah. we thought, you know, we'll go there and we'll create this. So we got there and when we arrived, one of the girls had, one of the main girls, most important ones, had to run away because her family was gonna honor kill her because they, now she was gonna make music videos. It was fine to take money from Lanny while she wasn't getting a lot of exposure, but as soon as she was getting exposure, then all of a sudden she shamed the family. Uh. So, so then she was she was hiding out, and then finally I'll make, I'll make a short you know story short. Eventually, um, Lanny brought her into the recording studio. The Raven Ray group protected her, although they did have an altercation with some of her family members, and one of the soldiers lost an eye, another one broke a wrist, but then there's some other folks that got hurt in that conflict. And then, but we got her in, she recorded, we've got a great recording, we're working on post-production for it now. Um, and then Lanny found a home with whom she could live permanently afterwards with the help of that, of the, um, you know, Afghani government. And, um, and while we were there, um, the Taliban um, did a truck attack. It was literally a kilometer, a little over a kilometer away from us. It killed 30 and wounded over a hundred others. And they blew up a truck outside what's called the green zone. And, the way the earth shook was like nothing I'd ever felt before. Fortunately, we were in, they have a basement bar, which is like their, um, their bunker. Yeah. It happens to also be their bar um, underground. And yeah. so fortunately we were down there when it happened, but it was just, um, it was amazing. Like how the whole city all of a sudden, like, you know, just chaos. And even when we left to the airport, you know, two days later and a, um, uh, an IED went off in the road about maybe a half mile up the street from us. Our driver didn't even flinch. He just went a different direction to the airport. You know, meanwhile, there's like a mushroom cloud in the road. And so, so he was so I, accustomed. He was so accustomed to. That's my point. All right. So that's so accustomed that's, space. To it. that's his that's his reality, his space. Right. Whereas we would flip out. This uh, is everyday uh, life in Kabul. It's yeah. bombings regularly, um, you know, people killed, chaos. It's just madness there. And here's Lanny doing this amazing thing for these girls. He has roughly 50 main girls that come to the school and, and he gives them $300 a month to their families, which is what a middle-class income is. In comparison in Zanzibar where we were, the yeah. annual income of a family on the average is about $250 annually. So just to give you a little bit of perspective. Yeah. Um, but now with the US military pulling out of Afghanistan, um, the girl, the prospects for the girls is pretty grim. Like yeah. they're very like many of which will probably be murdered or are trafficked, married off. Um, and Mark and I interviewed them 
about this prospect while we were there, because at that time, Trump was um, supposedly doing negotiations with the Taliban, um, which probably is for all of them, they think it's just about pharmaceuticals, yeah. about the, opi you know, the opium industry and getting yeah. um, opium to American pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. I guess, and but they also talked about how if um if America pulls out, soldiers pull out, then they're basically like they enjoyed life for a couple of years with Lanny and the miraculous love kids. And then after that, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Uh Brian, it seems to me like you go to a uh the State Department website and look through any place that the State Department has travel warnings for, <laughs> and you go, okay, those are the places I want to go to. Uh, as soon as you say it's dangerous here, we uh, strongly encourage no tourism or visitors to go to this country. Uh, you start perhaps looking into it and say, why is this the case and what can we do there? Now, would you call this uh, moving from, say, Egypt to Afghanistan, would you call this, generally speaking, consciousness raising, bringing uh uh, bringing into focus areas of the world that may not get the press coverage or get the wrong kind of press coverage by visiting and hearing the voices of people who actually live there. Um, you know, I mean, something that Mark and I are very much aware of is that we're in a very privileged position to be tenured academics at a major you know, university with the funding to go and, um, you know, to different locations and really, um, you know, kind of, you know, collaborate with people there on the ground and, you know, to share with them. But, you know, we get to leave, you know, when the shit hits the fan, we get on a plane. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like, uh, I would, I don't think we're doing a whole lot of consciousness raising, you know, I think to some extent that, you know, we help maybe to make some people here more aware of what's going on in other places. But really, what we decided it's kind of the goal for our project. We, beginning, we began working on child soldiers. We're interested in how people can perpetrate such violence onto anyone, much less children and stuff. And then we transitioned when Arab Spring started, beginning with the, with this, um, the self immolation of Mohammed Bouazizi in, um, in Tunisia that ignited you know, Arab Spring. We then started, we then became interested in, um, in just like, how artistic production can be used to make change happen. We started to look at that. And then we started to think how, to what extent can we um, kind of analyze or understand what some groups are doing effectively so that other groups can learn from them that wouldn't otherwise have the exposure to their techniques and what they do because they just don't know about them because they live in places where they just wouldn't get that information. So kind of what became the goal of our project was actually to really make a record of what's effective and what's not effective. For example, the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico um, are probably, are arguably the most effective revolutionary group of the last century. So Mark and I spent a couple of years um, arranging a, a time to go visit them in the jungle. So we went down to Chiapas and we spent two weeks with them way out in the jungle at all their compounds. Initially, when we went in, they met us in San Cristobal. You know, they vetted us in person after having vetted us before. Then we, we went to some sort of local compounds where they went and everybody wore masks so we couldn't see who they were. Um, we spent like maybe a week with them, just talking to them, getting to know them. And then we moved in further and then, um, and then uh, we were picked up in the jungle and then taken way in, all the way in. And then we spent two weeks just interviewing, spending time there, you know, um, getting to know everyone and trying to really get an understanding of how they're so successful. You well, know, wait, how how uh, aligned or non-aligned is this group with the uh, drug cartels? Not at all. In fact, glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. So the Zapatistas don't allow any trafficking through the whole area that they, you know, that they control. In fact, just before we got there, some, um, you know, cartel folks came and tried to negotiate with them, which often happens. And so um, um, whether or not it was the Zapatistas themselves or there's another group that I don't want to mention right now that works with them, um, they cut the heads off two of the guys and put them on stakes and sent the other guy back. And they just said, this isn't happening here. The Zapatistas are sober too. There's no alcohol. 
you know, their main products are, um, are uh, coffee and chocolate, and they're entirely self-sustaining. I mean, members of their community go out, they train at universities, and they come back. You know, um, they're, they're a non, although when they, the revolution was launched, you know, there were roughly 10,000 soldiers, you know, men, women, and children carrying every, you know, imaginable weapon, you know, from like rifles to, um, you know, forks. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, in the end, that revolution, I think the fatalities from that were very small, you know, very small number, you know, um, you know, possibly, you know, under 10 or 20, you know, they managed to get the Mexican government to just um, submit essentially, and give them autonomy. And they managed to maintain that autonomy by through nonviolence, you know, although they're always ready. <laughs> they're ready if they need to be. Well, they were ready. Somebody was ready to cut off a couple of heads uh, right. and uh, send that. Um, what the <laughs> but I won't say that was the Zapatistas themselves. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of groups that are operative there. Yeah. And um, for instance, um, Israel has some paramilitary groups that are operative in the jungle in Chiapas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and where we were there, we had to actually avoid them. We had to change our route one time because what they're doing is trying to provoke the Zapatistas and other groups so they can get some more that, that allow for justification of the Mexican army coming in and suppressing it. And yeah. since the Mexican army buys their weapons from Israel, who gets their weapons from us? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of um, <laughs> there's a lot of um, sort of vested interest there, yeah. and also because the Zapatistas, you know, show um solidarity with the Palestinians, you know, maybe the Israeli paramilitary groups can um, you know, that gives them at least some kind of you know, quote unquote, justification for what they're doing. But I don't know. Well, yeah. arms dealing, it all just comes down to money, you know, and it's usually not about politics. Why were the Z Zapatistas so secretive, and uh, what are they doing that could be viewed as? Um, are, are they, in some some ways, uh, are they still revolutionaries? Do they still function as revolutionaries? I guess is what I'm asking. I think they're really, in some ways, like the truest revolutionaries, and that they created a system that's unlike any other system. In each one of their communities, they rotate leadership every month. Right, and so they had this way of rotating, and they and they really almost like they're definitely a democratic system. Maybe they, to some extent, they operate. You know, true consensus is kind of an impossibility, but they probably approximate it more than you know most groups that try. And um, and they have this way of just sort of um, of distributing power, such that it's more egalitarian than anything else that I've seen. And they also their educational system, despite the fact that they're in the jungle, is actually quite rigorous. You know, it's really global. You know, they teach all the members of their community about the whole world, you know, to, to whatever extent they can. You know, their members of the community go out and get trained at universities, but then they actually come back. Um, and so it's really, um, it's really not like anything else I've seen. So what's revolutionary about them is they really are living off the world grid. They are, um, even um, Marcos, who is their leader, you know, he, 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 in a sense, um, banished himself it was to a kind of banishing mediation so that there was no focus on him anymore as being the leader because he wanted to sort of just distribute the idea of leadership because the Zapatistas are really about community. They're not about one individual leader. Yeah. And, and when you're with, within the community, from what I can tell and from what I've learned, the distribution of power between men and women is quite equal. Yeah. Uh, it, that's so interesting because the... Uh, I'm very much a, um, I don't know what you would call one of the, uh, not a super fan, but I have kept up through all the media, whether it's um, uh, Winslow's novels or uh, a, a newspaper report or the series Narco, so forth, of the kind of history, very recent in, in my life history of the drug wars that uh, range from uh, Colombia through Mexico in, in that area. But I have I have not really come across as Zapatistas in modern times, of course, you know, famously in the uh, in the initial revolution. So that's just extraordinarily interesting to me how they function and how they manage to not become co-opted when no one else seems to be able to to avoid it by certain interest in the uh, Either, either drug cartels or in, intelligence services, various intelligence. I think they're, um, 
there's so much fidelity within that community. They don't allow anybody to divide them. I mean, money is not going to entice them. Yeah. It's just like, that's not enough for them. It's so far beyond that. You know, their, um, their symbol is the snail, right? That the revolution happens at the pace of the snail. Yeah. And, and everything is about patience. You know, it's like a coup d'etat is typically non-successful because doesn't, there's not enough time is, is like Bill Quattari would say for, for micro subversions to happen over time. Like really, if you do things too quickly, like what happened in Egypt is that you end up getting a government that looks very much like the government you had before. Yeah. So the Zapatistas are really in the long game, you know I mean? And they really take their time with everything yeah. and they just have tremendous patience. In the communities that we're, we were in and we traveled all around, they um, cook communally. You know, I mean, there's, you know, hundreds of people in each community and they literally have these, um, you know, it's like a, you know, like a, you know, like a walk, but it's, you know, the diameter is like 12 feet, you know, to, like, gigantic, you know, things on, on which they're cooking. And it just, the feeling is so great. You know, yeah, that's communal. Sharing like that. It's really yeah. amazing. That the image, that image itself is communal, isn't it? Uh, that they would uh, do that. We've gone on for some time. I'm sure I'm tiring you out. <laughs> and, uh, uh, what I wanted to do is maybe close things up um, here now and uh, also extend our our thanks to you. And I say our thanks because uh, our, we, we distribute these videos among people you know and others you don't know, uh, but you, you will want to know in the future because we want to get you back over here so you can uh, revisit some old friends and make some new friends in the Shakespeare community, but also in the critical theory community there, uh, in, in Japan and the people who do things. And also <laughs> I'm certain there are plenty of extreme sports people. Well, I'm yeah. just, I mentioned yeah. in the beginning, I'm just, yeah. you know, I'd love to go skiing in Japan. Yeah. And I'd love to get, I love Japan so much. I had such a great time there. I mean, and there's so many things about being there, like they're innumerable that I found just really just exhilarating um, intellectually, culturally, food. Food, food foodly, yes. But yeah, I absolutely would just love to get back there. Um, I wanted to, I, one thought I had was, because I know we, we have been on for a while, is that I'd love to talk sometime. I mean, we went off on some other subjects about how this ultimately relates to, to my theater work and making theater and working as an artist. Yeah. Because some things we didn't really get into, which maybe we probably can't now, but maybe at some point you know, we could always do it again, is talk about how transversal poetics becomes a, a critical praxis. Let's do, let's do part two do sometime. Part two. Let's sure. do part two. Yeah. We'll do Brian part one and then Brian part two. So we'll and then also there's a lot of other theater makers. I feel like we talked a lot about about me and my, you know, kind of biography. But there's some other people that I'd like to talk about that I think are really been influential, you know, many of which are, you know, are some of which have been gone unnoticed, you know, within the scholarly community. Yeah. But within sort of the world of theater making. I feel like I've done really great things. I'd love to bring some more attention to them too. We can do that. And uh, how about in the fall? Sure, that'd be great. Uh, yeah. That that would be great for me, or maybe even the summer. Uh, I'm I'm not sure how summer's gonna. You know how we are now. We're not quite sure how things are gonna work out, but uh, I'm hoping to be in a very very happy place in uh, August. Uh, at least, uh, but we, we don't know yet. So uh, anyhow, uh, uh, thank you again. And if I could ask you maybe to stay, I'll uh, stop the recording. Okay. And yeah, you I, bet. I ask yeah. you to stay. Th thank you so much again, Brian. Thank you, Tom.